Shall we begin? I'm the yolk and the egg. We ha- we have begun. <laughs> I am absolutely thrilled and humbled and elated to have on Angry Americans for this episode my very dear friend, uh, a true inspiration, and I think one of the most important people in this country. I try to interview folks who are iconic, inspirational, important, and I think we've been friends for a long time now. Mm-hmm. But this is a very, very important moment in America. And it's a very, very important moment, I think, for your leadership. Um, And so I thought nothing better than to go in a dirty garage (laughs) and have a conversation (laughs) with you about it. So welcome to the Classic Car Club Manhattan, Rachel Maddow. Thank you very much, PJ. It's very exciting to be here. It is freaking weird to be in. I mean, it's weird to be surrounded by cars that don't have tickets on them. Yes. Or that aren't in an elevator. I mean, this is I had no idea this was here. Yeah, it's a wonderful little secret, and it's a cool part of, like, American history and now global history. And we are next to the only place in New York City that has a better car collection, which is the NYPD impound next door. Oh, the tow lot? Where they get drug dealers (laughs) and mobsters and other cars. So it's a cool contrast. So that's, like, the place to hang out to see celebrities and and people are otherwise turning up in DOJ press Now TMZ knows. Yes. And they're probably, like, they're going to be camped out there from now on. (laughs) But that's why, if you're listening, you will hear some noise. We are... Right next to the West Side Highway. This used to be the horse stables for NYPD. Correct. This was the horse... Not that long ago it was the horse stables. Correct. Yeah, since I've lived here. Correct. So the horse stables for years and years would be right next to um, the impound, and it's right on the water, and they built this place about two years ago. It's great. Yes, and we are... I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. It's It's nice of you to have me, and it's nice of you to say all those... Nice things. It's I don't right. I don't recognize myself the way that you see me, and so um, it's uh, it's disorienting, but it's very kind. But that's part of why I wanted to have a conversation with you because I think you and I have been having informal conversations in bars and at, in in other social settings 15 years now. for fifteen years now. And when we walked in, I was trying to figure out: Did you get me on Twitter, or did I get you on Twitter? It was in a bar in the West Village, and I think it was you. You were. Do like, you remember which bar it was? I don't. It, you're, you have an encyclopedic but it was before knowledge. you moved to Battery Park. It right. was when you were still in the East Village. Right. So it was probably an East Village bar. I think it was on your side of town. So there's a whole thing about East Village and West Village. Yeah. And Never one, the twain shall meet. Well, one of my friends says East Village is for werewolves and West Village is for vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and if you live in New York, you know what that means. Or you've been in, but yeah. they're very different, right? <laughs> it's true. The East Village is always a lot grittier. You West might Vill- end up at the same party, but definitely not in each other's neighborhoods. Exactly. Only if you both But you <laughs> have a mastery of the West Village. I had a pretty good knowledge of the East Village. I bet we were at Daddio. I bet we were at Daddio Maybe. on Leroy and Bedford. That was yeah. my that was my spot. And, and now you have over nine million people on Twitter, <laughs> I believe. So you think we were talking about it at a bar, like debating whether or not? No, no, like, it was like early internet, and and like you know, hey, there's this thing, Twitter. I bet like, you told me to get on I, because it might have always, been. You've always been more forward leaning on that stuff than well, I. Well, I had amazing staff who always knew how to use technology for activism. Yeah. And, you know, they were going through all these iterations and we started out on MySpace and then went to Facebook and now I've kind of spanned. But um, MySpace. God. Yeah. But I bring yeah. it up in part because I think in preparing, thinking about this this discussion today, I feel like you, your leadership and I talk a lot about leadership on the podcast mm-hmm. has now transcended our society to this point where you are kind of a queen of all, like they used to call Howard Stern king of all media. <laughs> I think one, at one point you did, you did Howard Stern, right? I love that. But you're Stern. this, you're this amazing force that has combined like an element of Howard Stern, the power of technology, the, the, the responsibility of a Walter Cronkite. Wow. And really, but the, the power that you have to influence and educate this country is, is, is one of the main reasons I was so excited to talk to you for mm. this podcast. I would not put myself in the category with any of those folks, but I take your point that there is a, a sort of a, tw- a twining together of different platforms. Like my job, what I get paid to do is go on TV and explain stuff in a news environment, right? right. But in order to communicate stuff and have the best chance of conveying what I think needs to be explained or shown, you have to use social media in order to do it. And it's funny, like I'm, I'm definitely super invested in Twitter, not at all on Facebook. My show is on Facebook and does right. great stuff on right. Facebook. But personally, I literally have never used Facebook ever. 
I don't have my own page. I don't use it at all. And to, to be coming to grips now with the fact that Facebook is so freaking massive and so dominant and the whole discussion about Facebook as a utility and the antitrust stuff that potentially needs to be brought to bear there and the responsibility in terms of controlling speech and everything, I realized like how, how different would my life have been and how different would my perspective on the news be on that important point had I, at that bar with you, right. decided like, no, I think I'm just going to stick with Facebook. Like, bad people tell me that's what I yeah. should be doing. But instead, going into the Twitter universe, it's much smaller. And it's actually a much uh, more insular community. It is. Twitter is a, Twitter is a, uh, is a specific slice of the world, particularly the journalism world. It is. And so are podcasts I'm learning too. Yeah. Like part of what I've realized with this podcast is that it has a very kind of elitist audience at this point. Mm-hmm. And it's part of why I want to shoot, we're shooting video today and I'll put it on YouTube yeah. and I'll put it everywhere because when I went home for Easter to my family, it's, you know, my family is a working class family. My brother's a mechanic. One of his buddies is an electrician. The other guy's a janitor. There's a nurse there. They're like, how do we listen to podcasts? Yeah. I don't they're have still, a pod. Yeah, yeah. They're still on terrestrial radio. They're making the move over. And I actually, you know, I went through one of their old phones. I was like, shit, how do I find my podcast on your phone? Yeah. But part of what I think Joe Rogan, for example, has done is made it accessible everywhere yeah. and, and owned his content mm-hmm. and really tried to bring his discussions to his audience. And I think that's what Twitter has done for you, too. Yeah. And, and other, you know, in addition to television. Um, and, it's funny, it, though. Television, like, I think when we used to have discussions like this about crossing over into different platforms and meeting people where they are and, you know, how much do you want to be a pioneer versus figuring out where people are already looking for stuff and going there. We were having all those discussions. I think we thought that the old platforms would atrophy and disappear. And it turns out, no, they don't. And it turns out after all this time, not only cable TV, but like network TV still super matters. Yeah. And we're not, you know, in the in our demographic and in the stuff that we're both producing and listening to and, and connecting with all day long, we're not thinking about what's on network nightly newscasts. Right. But there are gazillions of people who are watching that every day who where that still absolutely makes a difference and that audience isn't disappearing. Do you think they've calcified? Like those audiences have kind of gotten deeper into who they already were. So if you think about network television, it's generally older people. Right? Like young, yeah. nobody under 30 is watching network television. Maybe. And, right? Or maybe people under 30 who we don't, who we know aren't right. watching it. But I mean, those, if that were, if it were true that it were only 70 year olds who were doing it, that audience would shrink every year with death. Right. <laughs> it right. doesn't. But good doesn't content happen. is good content, right? So like yeah. for you, for example, do you have any idea what percentage of people watch your show online versus on television? I should. Like, they keep telling us that there's a way to parse that from the yeah. ratings, but I don't have a clear sense yeah. of it. But it's, I mean, in terms of whether or not the audience is calcifying, whether it's the same people who are just becoming devotees, like, we've seen in the past couple of years, like, the audience for, like, the the best or the, the highest rated cable news show of the night you know, double in terms of the number of people who are watching it. And it right. wavers, it goes up and down depending right. on who's winning and who's losing and right. what's exciting or not. But like the, what counts as like a good primetime cable news rating right now is double what it was three years right, ago, right. double what it was five years ago. And so, uh, you know, I thought cable news was dying. I thought people weren't buying TVs anymore. I thought people would only be watching <laughs> online and it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't register in the ratings. And it's, it's not going that way. It's but on some, levels, it's, on some levels, on some levels, I mean, you have been a part of saving cable news. Oh, really? I mean, this moment in time has obviously fueled it. Yeah. But I think, you know, when you and I, when you first started doing your show, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you had a TV. No, you, I didn't you, have a TV for a few years. You told me, you, you know, you very proudly used to say, I don't have a television. Yeah. And you were making a television show without consuming media <laughs> on a television. Right. And maybe that gave you the perspective of being able to push the boundaries of television because people would have said, you can't do an 11-minute monologue. Right. Or you can't do this, this really detailed analysis of documents. But you pushed the envelopes of what TV was doing, mm-hmm. and now it's worked. And to be like super honest about it, part of the reason I didn't have a TV was specifically for that purpose, is that right. I didn't want to subliminally absorb the norms of the industry and then reflect them in a way that was, you know, uh, essentially mimicry. Like, I don't, I don't want to do it. It's the same reason that I don't read, like, opinion columns. Like, I don't read editorials don't. and stuff because uh. I don't want to absorb other people's opinions. I, uh. want to, I just read news and form my own opinions based on that, but I don't want to take in other opinion content. That's why I don't put pundits and stuff on TV. But the other thing about that sort of 
you know, the, the doing things differently in the cable news environment isn't just that I was, not, I was trying consciously not to ape what existed on TV. I was basically putting radio on TV. Right. Like I came from a right. specific place. I came right. from radio and right. I was like, that's the only way I know how to think in terms of presenting information to other people. I've never been a professor. I've never been in TV news. I've ne- All I've ever done is radio. So I'm just going to do a radio show where and pretend that uh, there's no camera there. And that's how I approached TV. And that's, I think, why I was comfortable from the beginning only putting on one guest at a time. You don't want, honestly, I don't, I mean, I know people do it in the radio, in, ra- in the radio, but I don't want three or four people or five people talking at once. I want a back and forth with somebody right. who's worth listening to. Right. I don't want to hear a fight just for the sake of a fight. Right. I want to hear somebody presenting information and, and a host who's helping elucidate it. Mm. And that's, a, I think that's a radio trope. But it's also, I think, defined you as a media leader. You are now the interviewer, right? Your, your mm. segment is called The Interview. I, you know, I watched this week when you had uh, Beto on. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they're coming to you. Yeah. They're, they're the candidates, the Democrat candidates right now. Democratic candidates are all coming to you. It's 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 a stop on the primary tour at this point <laughs> is to come to the Rachel Maddow show. But I, I think that's in part because your interviews are so focused. I mean, I've been in that chair, right? Yeah. I know what it's like to be interviewed by Rachel Maddow, and it's fun to now be on the other side. But to be interviewed by you is to have your absolute and total focus mm-hmm. and to have your preparation and have your thoughtfulness. And when you're interviewing someone, you're, you're paying attention. You know, I've, everybody's been in the chair with plenty of people who aren't fully paying attention or are looking at the teleprompter or, or their head is off onto the next segment, but you're, you're zeroed in. So do you think about the power that your interview style has and the platform that you have has now? Well, it's, it's interesting in the 2020 context because, I mean, we have, what, 21 declared candidates now, maybe yeah. 22 as yeah. of today. Yeah. Um, and I do want the chance to talk to everybody. And I do, I am super interested in this moment at how the largest major party field in history is going to produce what needs to be the strongest Democratic candidate you know, depending on how serious you see the stakes of this election, maybe the strongest Democratic candidate ever, the candidate who has the best chance of beating a super non-traditional, super powerful candidate on the Republican side. I don't know how that's going to go. I'm really interested in the process. I'm really interested in the characters. And I'm not that confident in my interview capacity. I mean, you know what my show is like on a night when I don't have a big interview, right? I do like a 23 freaking minute monologue with no guest and then bring on reporters to help me understand other stuff I'm explaining. You know, it's not like it's, it's, it's not people driven. Mm. (laughs) And so spending time, spending two or three segments with Kamala Harris or, or Beto O'Rourke or, you know, Steve Bullock or any of these people or whatever is, I feel like it's outside my wheelhouse in terms of what I'm good at, but I also desperately want to understand these candidates and see what they have to offer and understand how this process is going to go. That's the power of it though, Rachel, is the humility Mm. And that you actually are having a conversation to seek information. Yeah. It's not to prove a point. It's not to win. It's not to get ratings. It's to actually seek, seek information, yeah. right? Seek knowledge. And, and that, and that I think is what has defined your interview style mm. and defined your preparation. But there's also another part of this to go back, I think, into, to maybe your roots. You are nice, <laughs> you are very nice. Like people always ask me, you know, is Rachel as nice? You are from the day I met you, right? And and I want to tell that story, you know, at some point. <laughs> but you're always very kind. Mm. You're very you're very polite. You're very nice in an environment in media and politics where that is unusual, I think. Mm. And especially for me, when I was coming up, I was nobody. I was a dude. They were cycling me through, right? And and people sometimes treated me great and sometimes treated me like shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you are known, including by the people who ferociously oppose you, for being respectful and, and thoughtful. And that is especially important right now in setting a tone. So is that... Is that a conscious thing? Is it who you are? Where does that come from? Because when we're looking for role models for our children, mm. the president is the anti-role model mm-hmm. in the way he treats people and acts. And in many ways, you, you are a role model because wow. of the way you carry yourself and treat people. So do you, do you think about that or where does that come from? That is very nice of you to say. Talk about being nice. Um, I, don't, I don't think about myself in those terms, I don't think. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I... I do, let me say again, that's very nice of you to say. I'm a little overwhelmed. But, um, well, let me talk about it in the context of how I think about my show and why I don't bring people on to fight. 
and why I don't bring people on to destroy them. You know, like right. there's this one, like this, right. there's, there's a whole lane in cable news, which is like host kills normie, right? right? right, <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> host pounds rando. Um, I don't believe if I'm asking people to come spend time with me on a show that I am hosting, I implicitly want you to trust that the person I'm bringing into that space, the person I'm giving time to, the person I'm putting in the chair is there because I believe they have something to say that you should hear. Mm -hmm. And so I'm never going to bring somebody on to say, you're wrong. Let me tell you all the reasons you're wrong. You're terrible. Why are you talking? Right? Mm -hmm. That's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I only, even when it's people who I disagree with, I I want somebody to be there because I think my audience should hear what they have to say because it's valuable. And so I never want to undercut that by um, being uncivil and by interrupting for the sake of interrupting or um, by trying to shame somebody for being there in the first place. The invitation should mean something. Um, and I think that's just, I think it's just about respecting my audience. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we're not there to, we're not trained dogs, you know? We're not performing a Punch and Judy show. We're here to tr- hopefully increase the amount of useful information in the world. That's like my show internal motto. And the only way you can do that is by bringing people to the conversation that have something to add. Mm. And so people who have something to add ought to be treated that way and welcome. Mm. You're very you know, skillful and diplomatic and in, in always focusing on the show, mm. which is like the higher mission of Rachel Maddow, right? Is, mm-hmm. is the show. And yeah. that, I think that, that comes through. Ten and a half years now. Yeah. But there's also... You know, there's a, there's an importance to it now that has transcended the actual show, and that's you know I know you don't like when I go this place, but your example, the interview with you and Mayor Pete, mm. in my view, like I was trying to remember a modern example, and it reminded me of when um, when Colbert uh, talked to Joe Biden about family members dying. Yeah, there was this profound moment where Biden was talking about losing Bo. And Colbert kind of opened up about losing his family in, in a plane crash when he was younger. And there was this very powerful moment of honesty talking about grief and how to deal with grief. Yeah. And you and Mayor Pete both talked about coming out. And what I thought about was my kids and how, you know, they, they now have a role model. They have someone to aspire to be like, someone who is courageous and, and someone who is defining you know, a next generation of leadership Hmm. just by your example, you and Pete having that conversation was historic, Hmm. right? For you, for him as a a rising candidate who's openly gay and for you as the number one force in news, that was unthinkable 20 years ago. Yeah. And, and so, so do you think about your role in history? Because you and I have talked about this over beers and you're you're often uncomfortable about it. Even now, uncomfortable about it. I think you are one of the most important social movement leaders, maybe public intellectuals of our time. And, and, And do you think about that at all? You have tried to make me think about that as my friend a number of times, and I have made you talk to the hand (laughs) a number of times about that friend. I mean, it's the same thing back to you. I mean, I don't, if I turn that conversation around, if turn that question around to you, which you don't want me to do, what you will tell me is that, no, it's not helpful to think about it in those terms because you have to get the work done. Actually, I wouldn't say that. I, I, I wouldn't. I, I actually think by, by, by default on some points, I have to recognize it hmm. because, you know, over the years, what I've learned is that something I said on TV or, a, you know, a bill we passed or a program we created probably had more of an impact than I realized. Yeah. Like the ripple effects, you know, we've in, in the work that I do and the work that you do, we've saved lives. And, and I've come to realize that over the years. And now that I have children and I think about, you know, my legacy, if mm-hmm. you will, um, I, I really do think that it, it happens. And, and you are very good at protecting yourself um, and, and your, your intellectual space. But I think over the years, you've met more and more people who, you know, you can't walk down the street like you used to be able to. And people well, it walk depends up on to what I'm wearing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, but but you really are. You know, you've changed lives beyond the the, the policy, which is obviously important in leadership. The, the the lives individually that you have touched through your example, you know, is is important. You're you're a movement leader in the same way. If people want to look at historical context, I mean, if you look at the '60s and you were going to talk about someone of importance, pick a person: Malcolm X, some, some you know. Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy. If you thought about the 15 or 20 people that were defining that time, I think when people look back on this time, they're going to look at you as one of the people defining this time and also defining what it means to be American. And we talk about a lot in the show, defining true patriotism. Hmm. And so, 
Well, the diff- I mean, the difference in where you and I have been over the past 15 years, though, is that you, at, with IAVA, back, back to Operation Truth and all the rest of it, and even pre-Operation yeah. Truth, what you were doing when you first came back, was about building a movement, connecting people, and getting stuff done. Like, activism, um, not just in concept, but in deed, right? Getting, mm. getting shit done, which you right. freaking did. Your record is astonishing. I was an activist right up until the moment when I met you, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, I was an activist until 2004 when I stopped doing activism, moved to New York City, and started doing media instead. And I told the, my colleagues in the activist world when I left in March of 2004, I don't think this is going to work out. I'll be back in six months. Somebody else take over the listserv, you know? Um, but I stopped doing what I was doing and st- stopped doing activism and started instead explaining things for a living. And so to the extent that that is helpful to people or people count on it or it helps people use information or get information in a way they wouldn't otherwise have that causes them to then live their lives in a different way or uh, advocate for things they wouldn't otherwise know about. I recognize that it has an impact, but I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to move people from X to Y. You're not trying, but is it not the evolution of activism? No. Right? When it's, you -mm. you don't think that the values and even the, the policies I, you care about, right? Yeah. It could be something as simple as being civil to people yeah. or your focus on national security, right? I think a part of your work that is way underappreciated is when you wrote Drift, your, your understanding of national security. We're sitting here today as, you know, when we finish this interview, we might be at war with Iran. Yeah. This is real shit now, right? And, and you know that in a way that I think, frankly, some folks don't have the mastery of mm. um, because they didn't come from an activist background, because they didn't come from an academic background, because they didn't choose to understand the importance of national security. Yeah. It's a blank spot for many in the media, in my view. Yeah. But for you, it's it's core. Um, so on some levels, I see some people are more activists than they want to be. Sean Hanley's an activist. He may not be for, for, for the side that you choose or I choose, Van Jones is an activist now. So is, yeah, the, and, is and the media wrong is, with that? I mean, some is people, the media the new landscape for for some people use a, use their place in the media to try to get bills passed, get specific people elected, right. get specific causes uh, surfaced in such a way that they get moved in the direction that that person wants. That's a that's a totally reasonable thing to do with your place in the media. Not what I'm trying to do. Right. But I do think that by having the freedom to explain things the way I see that they are in the world and having the freedom to choose what stories I think are important to tell and how to tell them. And, uh, and, and honestly, it's just as important that I choose what not to cover that freedom. I do think helps elucidate things in a way that other people may Mm. use that Mm. in order to do things Mm. in their activist life or in their communities or in their political engagement that they wouldn't otherwise do. Like I get that it can have an activist or political impact, but I'm not. That's not your intention. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm never getting the phone saying this is your yeah. number for your member of Congress. But Call you're al- you're also um, you're the explainer in chief now, in many ways for for certain audiences, right? Because Obama's out of the mix. Yeah. And Trump can't explain anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> Although it's been very interesting to watch him try to explain tariffs. <laughs> that money goes right to you. What? That's what are you talking not about? Not how it works. It's not how it works. Okay, let's start here. Spell tariff. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you, you I, this is another part of of Rachel Maddow that I think is important. Is people are scared, people are worried. This show is, is, in my view, a part a distress signal on behalf of America because of this moment in time we're in. And people are looking for hope, but they're looking for clarity and they're looking for someone to make sense of it. And you, every night, nine o'clock you help people understand what the hell is going on. And, and that in, is a public service, in my view, in the, in the traditional you know, form of public service in media. And it is absolutely vital right now. And I, I actually have asked you this, and this, I'm going somewhere with this. You know, the cocktail moment is how <laughs> you used to end your, some shows. On Friday um, nights. Yeah, and I also had a conversation with you. I said, I, you got to think about something. So you end your show, and often you kind of do a mic drop. And the mic drop is often like, Tune in tomorrow. We'll yeah. see what crazy shit happens next. Watch this space. And then you usually go out to dinner and you know, you have you have an evening, you drive home. Other people go to sleep or try to go to sleep and they're fucking terrified. <laughs> so I think you have single-handedly contributed profoundly to the insomnia <laughs> in this country over the last eight years. The Rachel Maddow Show, giving America bags under its eyes <laughs> since 2008. <laughs> You're yes. welcome. So 
so there is a question here. Uh, can, can you bring back the 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 uh, cocktail, cocktail moment? moment? Because the only thing you know more about than politics, in my view, is is liquor. I do know a lot about. I'm semi pro. You really you have yeah. an encyclopedia. Every you you are also a very generous gift giver, yeah. and you give me a gift every year, and it's usually some obscure form of liquor that I've never heard of in did my you, life. Did you try the Velvet Philander yes, this year? it's amazing. It's amazing, Everything right? you send me is amazing. <laughs> but you know this inside and out. So you could do, you know, if you wanted to take a sabbatical, you could do a show just on, on and what's the technical term for liquor or drinking? Because I don't want to dismiss it because it's not like you're no, an alcoholic. Just drink, you have just... an actual really amazing understanding of bartender level understanding. I'm the thing about me with bartending is that I'm super slow. Like I love making drinks, but like have yourself another drink for a while. Make yourself something because I'm going to make you a drink. It's going to take me 40 minutes and I'm going to do the garnish seven times. But I'll think by the time you ultimately get it, I have a very non-commercial ability when it comes to bartending. I'm just interested in booze. But I don't. Okay, so the cocktail moment. That's the that's the tagline <laughs> from this episode. I'm just really interested in booze. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> I, I'm 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 an enthusiast. Let's yeah. say. Um, but you reason- take the same approach to fixing cocktails that you do to writing a monologue. Yeah, you I'm really faster do. with a monologue. But the, the thing about the cocktail moment is that we, we, I realized that I felt um, not irresponsible with it, but I felt like I, I had mixed feelings about helping people drink better. Like I've always thought about the cocktail moment as A, it's kind of funny. B, it's a little surreal to see somebody who's just been talking about the news for 43 minutes yeah. in their 45th moment, 45th minute tell you how to make a champagne cocktail or whatever. Um, but the, I am in, you know, telling people how to, how to better enjoy alcohol. And at this moment, since the 2016 election, I feel like liberals who are watching me in particular are at the edge of the cliff yeah. and maybe like pushing booze. It's like booze is great. Booze is also not medicine. Right. Like this will not we can improve make, We can mix life. it up. We can do a cocktail hour. We can do a bike ride yes. with Rachel Maddow. We can do we like can do meditation. Moment. Meditation. Right? We can cocktail do, moment should totally be meditation I'm, moment for the rest of the Trump administration. I'm telling you. Like I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do security on this endeavor. <laughs> if we want to take you out and do meditation <laughs> in the park. Whatever it is. We'll have but, to differentiate it from John Stewart moment of Zen. Yeah. Well, you will find a way right. as, you, as you always do. Right. right. So, so I want to go, we are, as we're talking, there's a dude hammering on a, I think it's a Porsche behind us. Is that a Porsche? Um, but I ask every guest and you're not getting off the hook on this one. Yeah. Rachel Maddow, what was your first car? Oh, you are going to get an answer from me. You will not get from anybody else. I hope so. It was a 1970 <laughs> Audi 100 LS. What's an Audi 100 LS? Glad you asked. It's the size of a Ford LTD, two door. Wow. So each door was like nine feet long and nothing was power, anything. The steering, here, hold the mic. Okay. Steering wheel was like this. Okay. It was now like to describe for audio viewers, your arms are spread. Three as, feet across. Three feet across. It also. Like you're driving it a was ship. A stick, it was a stick shift with like a two foot long stick shift. And each of the seats was like a captain's chair, like an easy chair. Wow. My mom's, the woman who cut my mom's hair at the time, her husband had been a, a prisoner in state prison in California. <laughs> and when he was in the star, he did the upholstery course in prison and became this really good, super old school upholsterer who learned it in prison. And for his first job after he got out, I paid him to upholster the seats in my Audi 100 LS. And so they were like, they could have been in a museum. Wow. They were spectacular. Huge steering wheel, huge gear shift, nine foot long doors. It was dark green. It was spectacular. Um, it also, like, went, I went through seven clutches. I was also 16. I didn't know how to drive. And it was, the, it, but it was a freaking tank. It's great. That's an amazing answer. Yeah. Dark green on the outside. What color was that interior that Tan. the guy from prison made? Tan. Although Tan. he did contrasting dark leather on the sides of the, you could see the sides of the seats all the way around all four sides. Are there photos of said vehicle? I wish there were. When I went away to college, when I, I didn't have time to put in like the seventh clutch <laughs> and I didn't bring my car to college. I left it sitting in front of my parents' house. My parents and I kind of had a falling out with soon after I got to college and I kind of left the car languishing there for a little uh-huh. while. My parents literally took it and gave it to the high school auto shop for a tax break. Wow. They gave it away. Wow. They were like, it doesn't run and you're not coming home. It sounds like it was a good experiment for them to work through, right? <laughs> That's good to That's say. better than breaking down the, the regular old I Ford that rolls I just want the in. seats back. 
Like I just, I feel I think, like I think we can. Around. So we've we've organized the Angry Americans community in the past to take action. Mm. I think we can find a way to to find this car <laughs> a version of it. We've got many car Castro enthusiasts. Castro Valley High School Auto Shop, approximately 1992. Did you get a dark green Audi 100 LS with gigantic doors and custom seats? Can I have the seats? This back? is going to be an entirely different podcast. <laughs> Searching for Rachel's car, it's going to be like finding Richard Simmons. Right? Uh, that'll be my next podcast. Is finding Rachel. <laughs> Maddow's car. Car seats. And we'll do a tour of meditation and drinking, <laughs> trying to find this Audi somewhere on the landscape. I bet you it's not in America. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, like also, what? Like, how do you throw away a car seat? Like, this is not a car seat you can transfer and put in another car. Like, maybe you could bolt this to your, the seat of your Scooby van or something, but like, it's not going to fit on anything else. See, so anybody who, who questions me asking this question on the podcast, mm-hmm. I hope you are now satisfied. Because that answer was amazing. Also, the car had no seatbelts. And my dad and I went to a junkyard and took seatbelts off a Volkswagen Bug and bolted them into the Audi ourselves, which is amazing on a lot of fronts. But A, can you still do that? B, like, why did we think those seatbelts would hold? Like, we just, we just screwed them into the into the. Pillars, Thank you, Ralph you know? Nader. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, right. uh, going, staying in the way, way back machine, um, the first time I believe I met you was when I got a phone call in 2004 and someone asked me if I would like to be on Chuck D's radio show. The great and Chuck it was D. at this time in spring of 2004 where every time someone called me, I thought they were bullshitting me. I thought it was somebody that I grew up with. I saw George Stephanopoulos a couple of weeks ago and I hadn't seen him since 2004. And I told him the story. Someone called me up and said, hi, it's George Stephanopoulos. I'd like to know if you'd like to be on my show. And I was like, bullshit. Who is this really? Who is this Mikey? Who is this? He's like, no, it's really George Stephanopoulos. And I said, can I call you back? Give me a number. And he's like, okay, yeah. And I call him back and he's like, it's George Stephanopoulos. So it really was George Stephanopoulos. So I got a similar call from someone saying, would you like to go on the radio with Chuck D? And I said, yes. How many friends can I bring? I tried to bring like my whole crew from high school to go to the Chuck D show and I roll in not knowing who his co-hosts were and it was you with I believe a a terrible fashion choice a Red Sox hat on Ah. which you often wore and Liz Winstead, the, yeah. the, the, the now creator of the Daily Show, creator of the Daily Show and comedic legend. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was the three of you in this rundown studio where like wires were hanging out of the bottom. But you were kind of like, I thought you were the producer. It's like your head was down. <laughs> you were cranked. You were very nice. You were dressed similarly to as you are now with jeans and sneakers. This is like civilian Rachel, right? <laughs> but um, you were on Air America. Yeah. And you were doing radio, and you had come from North from Northampton, right? You had mm-hmm. done, done radio in Northampton. I had done, I was the morning. I was the morning show. I was the Big Breakfast on ninety three point nine the River in Northampton, Massachusetts, which I know well, yeah. having gone to school out in that area. Yeah. So you you go from Northampton to to Air America. I mean, when you look back on that time, and where you are now, where your where the country is now. Yeah. I man. mean, what do you what do you think? I mean, first of all, I'm still so impressed with myself that I had a radio show with Chuck D. You <laughs> I mean, should I'm be. Still, like, I'm still excited about you getting that call. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he's freaking Chuck D. It's Chuck D. I want to get him on this show. I mean, who's oh, more totally of an angry should. American than Chuck D? Wow. Right? Who taught Americans how to articulate what they were angry about? Chuck D. Yes. Yeah. Um, that show, I mean, that whole thing. I mean, I was I was finishing up. I finished... <sighs> I did my finished my PhD finally in 2000. Started doing morning radio, right? It was like my my side job. I was working for the National Minority AIDS Council and the ACLU National Prison Project. I was still you know still an activist. Yeah. And then I decided, you know, I'm really enjoying this weird minimum wage side gig I've got doing radio. They're going to try to make a liberal radio network. That remember, I mean, 2004. Yeah, yeah. That was let's try to invent a competitor to Rush Limbaugh, basically, right. and to the whole the whole right wing uh, AM radio ecosystem. And we all know how it worked out with Air America. But those few years ended up being so formative and interesting. I mean, um, Al Franken before his Senate career, mm-hmm. and Janine Garofalo, and Liz Winstead, and Chuck D, and. Uh, I mean, Sam and Sam Cedar. Yeah. I mean, Mark Maron, Mark Maron. Yeah. I mean, Mark it's Maron. just, um, so it's, you know, and Ed Schultz yep. and, uh, God bless Ed, you know, yeah. but it's, um, it is a weird thing. We ended up, we were in the, the first studio where you came in in 2004. Do you remember who was right next door to us? 
No, it was in Midtown. I remember it was, it was in Midtown. Midtown. It's right, right at 34th and Park. Is that building that's like catty corner? Yeah, it's like yeah, turned sideways. Yeah. And it's right by the most dangerous pedestrian in, intersection in Manhattan where like more people are killed crossing that street than any other street in Manhattan. I'm sure that's true. If you say it is, I'm sure it it's was, true and you've researched it. <laughs> it, was, it was a weird, weird place to work. And he used to get there at three in the morning. Yes. And, yeah, and anyway. But in our cruddy little studios, we were down this hall and you had to like snake around and go through the control room and everything. But then right next to us in our little grotty hole, there was the immediate next door studio. If the door was closed, you'd see a little pink shag coming out at the bottom under the door. Like a little like, looked like it looked like a jail for Muppets or something. Like what's that <laughs> little bit? You open the door. It was the Wendy Williams dressing room. <gasps> The Wendy Williams. Really? It was completely covered ceiling and walls and floor with like four inch long pink shag. It was, I had no idea. It was like looking inside a Muppet. For it people who don't know, maybe who don't know who Wendy the Williams Wendy is. The Wendy Williams show, Google it. You will spend a yeah. long time. She is an icon, a, a legend in radio. Astonishing. And, yes. She's, and I was like kind of obsessed with Wendy, Wendy Williams anyway. Yeah. Like she was like my only pop culture reference. Yeah. And so when I showed up day one at Air America, I was like, we get to work next to her pink shag dressing room. Um, that itself was pretty freaking moving to me. But then we ended up moving to Chelsea. Right. Right. And then we ended up getting shut down after a series of scam artists. Did you ever have Wendy Williams on your show or did you ever no, go on the Wendy Williams show? I have been on the Wendy Williams show. Wow. And I tell her the story. I was like, me and Chuck D and Liz Winstead, she, we had a radio show next to you. She was like, uh huh. Like lots of people had radio What's shows. What's the next weirdest to show you've ever been on? Other than your own, right? I did a. Um, interview with a guy from Air America, a producer from Air America, who went on to do a, a food and cooking show called The Sporkful. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> where I did a really long, detailed interview about how to reverse engineer the pina colada so that it's not gross. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that that is kind of gross. Um, but <laughs> No, not if you... Anyway. You reverse engineer a pina colada. Okay, so a pina colada, the way we understand it and the way it's been like introduced as a drink that is replicated in bars everywhere is it has gross ingredients. It has ingredients that like you wouldn't feed knowingly to a member of your family. Like citrus and milk is not something you generally put No, together? just like it's a chemical slurry. So do you mind breaking down a pina colada for us? Well, I would, I would refer you to my sporkful interview. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's cream of coconuts, pineapple juice, it's a few different kinds of rum. It's a delicious drink, but the original has coconut cream, mm. which is not a, not a thing found in nature. Mm. So you can create a pina colada that does not involve the synthetic chemical coconut cream mm. that has the pleasures of a pina colada. Hmm. But you have to work at it. This I'll is, walk you through it. My, I love my this. Friend. Yeah. I love this. Okay, so the, the and I want to be mindful of of your time um, because you've got to perhaps cover a war with Iran this evening. Can we talk about war with Iran for yes, a second? Yes, please. I'm. So there is. Was it Ben Rhodes who said like it's the foreign policy blob? Like there's the national security, uh, permanent infrastructure in Washington, like the think tank culture. I think he called them the blob. Mm. Right. Which is true. Right. I think that exists. I wrote about it in Drift. Mm. I feel like in Republican politics, there is a permanent blob of national security minded folks who are professionally interested in stoking war with Iran. Like there's just like that's an industry in Republican and conservative politics. Let's have a war yes. with Iran. Let's not have a nuclear deal. Let's re, re, rejigger all of our alliances so as to put the maximize the possibility that we have war with Iran. I've never understood why they want war with Iran so badly, but they are ascendant now within Trump's foreign policy establishment. The president has no connection to foreign policy whatsoever and doesn't understand it when he even tries to talk about it. But given that this is a permanent lobby inside the United States... Why are we about to have a war with Iran now? I feel like they always want it. They're always angling well, for it. I mean, because Bolton is now the king of the blob and Bolton's got his hands on the wheel. So it's just that they can. I mean, it's, 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 it's a confluence of events where now you've got potentially, you know, this is what Bolton arguably has always wanted to be in the position to the blob or maybe the Borg might be a better reference for mm. like Star Trek geeks, right? Mm -hmm. but, but this has been a culmination of, of many uh, strategies and efforts over the years, and now there's an opportunity, right? I mean, for if, if that's your goal, and their is to opportunity war with is Iran. we're 
in control and there's a president. Well, it's not just yeah, it's the president and it's and it's the 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 fear in Israel and it's maybe the American public's distraction with everything else. It's a disconnected military. It's uh, perhaps a shooting at a ship in in a Gulf, right? That, that is enough to spark a war like the Gulf of Tonkin. I mean, you, if you want to create a war, you know this better than anybody. You can create a war if if the factors are, are in play and enough. There's enough softness in places. You can start a war, and and there, not, it's not just people in the U.S. who want a war with Iran. There are plenty of people around the world who would like to see us in a war with Iran. So the so, alliance so ends up being us, this. Israel, and Saudi Arabia. And who knows who else? Right. I mean, we'll find out. You never know, right? Like we would have thought when, when I invaded Iraq, when we went into Iraq, we would have thought we would have the Turks, right? We thought Turkey would be with us. Yeah. I was supposed to come down through the north with, with our division was supposed to come down into Iraq from the north. The Turks said no. Mm-hmm. And so we came up through the south. Um, I don't think you know until it's time to pick sides in the dodgeball game. And you're like, okay, pick a side. We won't know where people shake out, right? But what, what, why? So, I totally agree with you in terms of John Bolton's life mission. This is what you and I talk about when we're not talking about pina coladas <laughs> and old cars. <laughs> but why, why, why is John Bolton a professional let's have a war with Iran Republican? Like, there, I realize there is a whole class of them. I, I don't, don't know understand if he's a professional, why but he, he is. is. But, I mean, but, that's his well, whole he, life. He, 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 is, he is the guy, right? If, if you were going to pick a fight with Iran and you're in the Republican establishment, you're going to probably, especially this crew of Republicans, Bolton is, is going to be the guy they choose. He's going to be the guy you make the captain of the dodgeball team, right? Like, and, and, and in some ways, maybe this is what he's waited for his entire life is this moment to be in this position where he thinks he's Kissinger or he thinks he's something else. And- I think it's backwards. I think that there was, obvious, there, I mean, who was the first national security advisor? Well, he's due to, due to, due to be sentenced yeah. soon, yeah. <laughs> General yeah. Flynn. Yeah. Uh, and then McMaster ends up being too much of, too, too normal, right? right? Has, to be, has to be destroyed, minimized, and then cast out, right? I'm surprised they're not, are, are they revoking his security clearance and, and, and having Bill Barr started a criminal investigation against him? Not yet, Maybe. but coming, yeah. right? And so now there's, we need a new national security advisor. Who else wants the job? And John Bolton, who is, lived his life on the ragged peripheral edge of hawkish Republican, let's have a war with Iran politics, is like, I'll do it. Are you kidding? There's a vacuum? I'll take right, it. Right. He, a guy like him could never get a national security advisor job in anything other than the kind of vacuum that was created in the Trump administration. Right. And he gets in there and immediately starts working on, all right, let's start this war with Iran. But why does he want it? Why is that his life's work? I don't. To me, on some levels, the, the intention is wasted effort. I mean, I don't know. It, it could be anything from profit to insanity. I don't know what his intentions are, but I do know that it's a guys. reality, yeah. right? And he, and he said it's a, it's a priority for him. He said it's something that, we, we, that it's well established that that's the path he wants to take. So on some levels, Rachel, like, I don't care about the why. Yeah. I want to figure out how to stop the what, Yeah. right? And, and I think that's probably where most of America will be right now. And, and that's going to be, this is going to be maybe, people, people, talk, keep, people keep talking about a, a constitutional crisis, Right. And I think that term has kind of gotten thrown around and you're, you have much better mastery of it than I do. Mm. I think a potential war with Iran is a constitutional crisis. If if we have no congressional oversight, if you have a guy like Bolton who can almost single handedly create a war. Right. Right. A ground war with a foreign enemy. Yeah. Is that not a constitutional crisis? I mean, yeah. You used to have Congress declare war. Right. And then I wrote a book about it. Then you end up with the president declaring war. And now you've got a non-Senate confirmed random presidential advisor starting a war. I mean, he's con- he's announcing the deployment of a carrier strike group to the Middle East. Right. He's convening meetings at the, C- at the CIA to review the, what they tell us is the intelligence that shows this incredible new threat from Iran. He's now announcing you know, the, the, the next steps in terms of uh, uh, Iran war planning. I mean, he's the one who asked the Pentagon for 120,000 strong invasion plan. He does. Yeah. The president does not seem to know this is happening. It's not like I would trust things would be he's going getting, better if the president. Oh, the president wants briefings on his 4th of July celebration. Yes. Right. And, but that's the opportunity. I mean, politics throughout history has been, you know, riddled with, with opportunists right. and people who pull on the power when they can. And, and there's an opening here. I and mean, that's what all the, it, it, that, that's I, what scares me the most about yeah. Trump on some levels. And maybe this is a pivot. You and I could do a daily podcast well, on we Iran. We talked about this right at the beginning of Trump getting in there. We, we talked about the danger of the vacuum on that, national that's, security. And, and not only the vacuum, but I think there's an issue that not enough people talk about. And you are the right person to talk about because I think you are one of the most intelligent people in the, in the arena in America. Some of these guys are dumb. 
Many of these guys are dumb or incompetent or ineffective. There is an inability to do things effectively, to spell check press releases, okay? To make sure you, you've got the right in country. They're the like red socks. the surgeon who cuts <laughs> off the wrong leg is entirely possible here. Like they yeah. might accidentally in, invade the wrong country. I mean, there is a level of competence that, that an incompetence that Trump has brought into this administration that transcends partisanship, in my view, mm -hmm. right? That because of his leadership, because of this atmosphere, especially really good, competent people don't want to work in government right now. Right. And that's a real problem for bureaucracies like the Department of Defense or the VA, mm -hmm. right? When you can't get effective people who are competent and smart. So what the hell happens when we go to war with Iran yeah. with, with the, the lowest common denominators in politics, right? I mean, like, a guy like Gorka is, could be running a war, right? Wow. This is not the firepower of the Obama administration. The early, this is not Kennedy's, you know, leaders coming in. I mean, even think and about, smart think about people Senior can, Bush, right? Smart I mean, people can really, make bad decisions, clearly, and that right. happens a lot around war. But they can war. handle the stakes. But they can, this is right. amateur hour on the highest stage in the world. Well, I, I mean, listen, Middle East peace is in Jared's hands. So we're good there. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, let's give credit where credit's due. Yeah. He did inherit his father's real estate yeah. empire. So, so maybe my question is uh, number one, are you worried about this lack of competence, yes. right? Effectiveness. And, you know, more broadly, there's no almost no national security discussion in the media right now. Ten years ago, you'd have me on, you'd have retired generals on, we'd be talking about war and conflict. Now you have all retired lawyers because everybody wants to talk about Mueller all the time. Yeah. So I mean I mean, what, I think what, is, what, is, what about this gap, right? Is this uh, the wag the dog reference is overused, okay? But when everybody's worried about whatever crazy shit Trump did this morning, it's really easy to start a war when nobody's looking. The question is whether or not any of the institutions that are supposed to handle matters like this kick in, right? So, like, you know, the it's been take a totally separate issue. Take trade, right? And this mm -hmm. like tariff game that we're playing with China, where the, where the president clearly does not understand literally what the noun means, let alone what the dynamics are that he right. set, in, set in motion here. And then there's, you know, Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton, who would, you, you know, is a like free trade Republican hardliner who's like, yeah, well, farmers got to make sacrifices, I guess. Because the president's doing this thing and all hail the great leader. Like, like, like our troops are making sacrifices. He took it one step further. Yeah, he said farmers need to be like our troops. Our troops are making sacrifices. And if farmers support tariffs, then therefore you are like the troops. Oh, yeah. It's, you you know, are it's, heroic, it's not, it's not, yeah. Right? Because Tom well, Cotton is fighting for the legacy of Lindsey Graham right now. Right? Like he's trying to find a way to be the, the, the least uh, ethical, maybe, person in, in the Senate right now. Like the, the, the most spineless, it seems like. Right. Lindsey Graham had set a pretty low bar. And it's like Tom Cotton's like, well, that's not low enough. I got to go lower. Let's compare this tariff stupidity to people dying in war. Right. Like, yeah, you 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 guys are you far, you farm Arkansas. Like literally his name is Cotton. He represents Arkansas. You Arkansas farmers have to sacrifice, but be glad. Be glad for it, because at least you're not soldiers dying in war. But he is smart. Like Cotton is smart. He's he is effective, smart. right? If, so, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're party agnostic, you probably want Cotton on your team. Like, he's going to hit a lot of people on the dodgeball court. He's effective, right? And, and so that's, that's happening, too, where so, people can manipulate this, this situation to, to make arguments that might not otherwise be so, viable so because the an, bar is so low. He's an effective as you say, effective Republican senator, super aggressive. Yeah. Effect, like, makes good talking point slams on other people mm -hmm. and turns things around. But, like, look at what just happened to him on something like trade. Okay. And in a guy who has to run for re-election in Arkansas, right? Now imagine what kind of profile and, and courage he's going to be on randomly starting a war with Iran in order to, like, Cross a knock, cross an item off John Bolton's bucket list. Mm -hmm. Like if that's the reason we're going to mm -hmm. send 120,000 Americans to go fight in Iran, like the Congress is supposed to be making a decision about when wars start and frankly when they end as well. What kind? What are we? What are we expecting from Republicans in particular in this Congress in terms of whether or not they will do? anything close to the right thing on this. All the Democrats will be yeah. against it, right? Yeah. But or you're you know. good at positing the question in a very Socratic method. But what do you think? What will happen? Like, can we count on our institutions? And on a very, are we in a constitutional crisis when this can happen? You know, you're, 
I think a const- I think a constitutional crisis is a, sp- a specific thing. It's when the the country approaches an uh, um, existential or potentially critical problem where the constitution is silent and it doesn't give us a way to address it, or when the strictures of the constitution are being ignored by people who have the power to act otherwise. So if you have a president who is directed by court order or even by Supreme Court ruling to do something and the president says, nope, that's a constitutional crisis because there's no other entity that you can go to between the Supreme Court and the Constitution uh, and the president to get him to defy a lawful order unless you bring in the third branch of government, impeachment. And if impeachment is somehow disabled as a remedy in that situation, well, then the Constitution isn't working the way it's supposed to do to solve that problem. Now, people having a big policy fight, there being bad decisions made, um, terrible people being put in positions of great responsibility, those are bad things. They aren't constitutional crises because we have remedies for them. So the place that I I worry about is when we get to um, places where our constitutional remedies no longer apply or just aren't available to us. And that's far off. That's hard. Like, Mm. all this stuff about the president defying subpoenas, a Mm -hmm. lot of people are calling that a constitutional Mm -hmm. crisis. That's not. That's a constitutional confrontation. That's him saying, don't want to, don't want to. But now the judiciary is involved deciding whether or not those subpoenas are going to be enforced. Like, you know, Mazars is going to have to hand over those financial documents (laughs) and Deutsche Bank is going to hand over the president's taxes. And uh, there is a court that's going to tell the IRS and the Treasury Department, you must obey this black letter statute and hand over the president's tax returns. Now, if the president, upon hearing that ruling, says, no, we're not, and I've ordered the 101st Airborne to stand on the lawn to prevent anybody from coming here to collect those documents, yes, then you're in a constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. But at this point, while the remedies, while the constitutionally available remedies are still working, we're just fighting it out. Mm. And hopefully we're good at that fight. Mm. So so what we've really got is leadership that ignores either the role of the Constitution or uh, their responsibility to abide by it. When we talk about the status of forces agreement, when we talk about how we wage war in a modern time, right, where there is no check and balance, right? There is no social backstop. There's no draft. There's no authorization of war. I mean, this is, this is the Wild West, which didn't concern people that much when you had a responsible president. Mm. But now you've got a loose cannon, you know, backed up by a gang of loose cannons or even worse, backed up by people who have an ulterior motive. And, and the, that, that's all blown apart, right? I mean, I mean, we're not having a discussion about the wars we're already in. Right. And it doesn't look like we're going to have a discussion on the war we're going into. So I guess what, what I'm getting at, Rachel, I know you know you care about this, is, is is this almost not worse than everything else, right? Like there's so much going on in the country right now, and, and there's so much that I think is very disconcerting and terrifying and, and troublesome. But isn't war a whole nother level let that, me t- that, that we're kind of missing in the media on some level too? Let me tell you the single piece of it that actually worries me the most, mm-hmm. which is going to sound counterintuitive yeah. to you. Um, The president, not that long ago, had a conversation that animated him or was advised by who knows who or read something on Twitter or saw something on Fox and Friends. The president was, the president had an idea and his idea was, I want all U.S. troops out of Syria within three weeks. And the president proclaimed, all U.S. troops will be out of Syria within three weeks. Now, where did the president get that idea? Why did he think that was a good idea? Did he understand what the knock-on effects of that would be? Was he advised by a foreign power to do that and manipulate it into it? Uh, you know, lots of reasons to question the wisdom of that order. The president gave that order. U.S. troops did not leave Syria in three weeks mm-hmm. or at all. Mm-hmm. That actually is the part of it that is most worrying to me. Mm. Even with a president who I believe is open to all sorts of manipulation and making decisions for all sorts of really bad and potentially criminal reasons. If the president is going to give an order and the way the U.S. government responds and the way the military responds is to pretend that that order doesn't exist, we are in a place that is beyond the constitutional instructions that we got from the founders about how to run the military right? and how to use American military force in the world. And we have the biggest freaking military in the world. And it's not being run by the civilian chain of command. And that worries me in an institutional way and in, uh, as an American more than it worries me that we have really bad civilian mm. leaders mm. because that's a process that's not supposed to break. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it puts an unfair responsibility or trust in our military. 
Where, yeah, where right and, now, the, the, I would argue the civilian population is way too trusting of our military. You know, we'll just, the, the generals will say no, or the generals will fix it, or they're the oh, adults good. in the room, right? Yeah. Oh, and that's good. Right. Wait a second. Right. You can, if you have bad civilian leadership, you can fix that. Right. In extreme circumstances, you can impeach and remove it. And in normal circumstances, you can vote it out of office. But if what is left behind in the wake of bad leadership is a military that knows any order it doesn't really want to follow, it doesn't have to, then we're Egypt. Yes. Right? I mean, right. that's, that's, how, that's how do you snap that That's a whole new level back? of scary. And you've got liberals and conservatives and Republicans and Democrats and independents and military families and non-military families who are super psyched that the military is disobeying Donald Trump on withdrawing from Syria or from any other order that he's giving because he seems like a nut. But if, if there's a political consensus that it's good that the military is on autopilot and isn't controlled by our bad civilian leadership anymore... Try explaining that. Go back in time and explain that yeah. to Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. I mean, that's fundamentally un-American. And that is, um, I, don't, I don't know how to fix that. And particularly because, in particular because there will be no political will to fix it from anyone. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no. That, I yeah. wanted to get into this because you and I have been talking about these issues off camera yeah. for 15 years. Yeah. Right? And, and you have been... Um, very thoughtful and smart in connecting with people in the military community and in the diplomatic community. And you have, I'm sure, a million conversations that you can ever share that help inform the way you learn about these issues. But I think you've always had your finger on the pulse of it in a very important and profound way. And you always kind of bring it back to remind the country, hey, this is, this is a whole nother level, mm -hmm. right? This is America's sons and daughters. This is our nukes, right? This is not just, you know, troops on the border. This is your finger on the button, yeah. right? Which this is, is the power to end the world. Yeah. That, that's it. So, okay. We're definitely going to need more drinks. Um, but a question I ask every guest. Yeah. What's something, Rachel Maddow, that makes you angry? And I want to, while you, I want to thank you for wearing our new gear. Represent. We have new American-made Oscar Mike gear that you can find uh, at the angryamericans.us website. You actually went out and bought, I think. Of I, course I did. You posted on the Instagram that you had these shirts and I was like, oh, how quick can I get it? You're such a good friend. <laughs> And you make cute shirts. They're very comfortable yes. and they're made in America. You they're know made right? in America. They're made in America by a veteran owned company. And that, they have a very easy to use interface. They will be very happy to hear that. It's true. Like I, you know, <laughs> well, for, if you tweet I, about it, we will find out how good their interface is. <laughs> I am not, I'm not a shopper. Like I'm not good at shopping. I get easily frustrated. Yeah. I'm happy they got it to you in time. I'm like, See? that's amazing. See? Cause they only went up like four days ago. So I'm on it. Yes. I'm on it. Yes. Okay. But um, what's despite something that, my t-shirt, I am not a very angry person. Yes. Which I think you know. Yes. I am a. Uh, I am full of emotions, but yes. anger is not is not up there for me. But on, I talk about it in terms of a righteous anger. Yeah. Right? Something that that inspires people to change and fuels the civil rights movement and other things. So or it could be we talked about scooters. Um. <laughs> you know. But what's something that, that that does make you angry? You're not an angry person, but might, you know, inspire your ire. Well, I. This is. It's a downer. But, yes. you know, just talking about what we were just talking about in terms of national security and whether there's a correction inside the government. Right. I, I think at the end of the day, when Mitch McConnell finally goes away, when he finally leaves the Senate, I think that his legacy as a leader in the Senate through these times um, will make a lot of people angry hmm. and probably including me. I, I just think... You know, he's, I know he's just one guy among a million in Washington, but you look at what he's done and what he's tried to do. Um, I mean, what's the, what, is, what is the most important thing for Mitch McConnell in the U.S. Senate? What is his number one priority and his most longstanding priority? Money and politics. Mm. He has been the guy who stopped every reform effort mm. on trying to democratize the influence of money in politics. He has been the, he has been the wall. Mm. And so to the extent that there's a, procedural root of all evil in modern American politics and how calcified it is and how non-responsive it is and how corrupting it can be. Um, the money in politics problem, the guy who did it, the mm. guy who committed that murder is, is Mitch McConnell. That's mm. his, been his number one priority. What are his greatest accomplishments as leader in the Senate? Um, I would say it's two things. And I think that he would agree with this. One was making the Supreme Court into something it has never been before, right. which is a partisan prize that is awarded by a partisan Senate to a, a president of their own party and otherwise withheld. 
I mean, by the time the 2016 election, Republican senators, including like Republican senators who we think of as normal, were saying, if Hillary Clinton is elected, I'll make sure that Scalia's seat is held open and mm -hmm. not filled for the four freaking years that mm -hmm. she's president. Because mm -hmm. Democrats aren't allowed to put nominees on the right. Supreme Court anymore. Right. That was, that's much Mitch, Mitch McConnell did. His other greatest legacy as leader in the Senate with the power that he's got is by blocking the response to the Russian attack on the election in mm -hmm. 2016. Mm -hmm. So the intelligence community and the national security apparatus during the attack comes to brief the Gang of Eight and they say, we want to make a public statement to let people know what's going on here. Mm. We want to warn people mm. about this unprecedented thing that's happening at this hostile foreign power attacking our election. We've never had to deal with this before. And people don't realize the scale of what's going on here. And Mitch McConnell is the one that says, over my dead body, mm. if you do that, I will accuse you of mm. partisan politics. Mm. So you put those three things together and add the icing on top of the cake, which is that he has turned the Senate into such a miserable freaking place for both Democrats and Republicans that even the reasonable Republicans just don't want to be there anymore because it's eating their souls. You know, people like Jeff Flake and mm -hmm. Bob Corker and all these mm -hmm. other people who have plenty of years ahead of them if they mm -hmm. want them don't want to be there anymore. And so people who actually might want to do something other than being a partisan canon have no reason to be there. And so they all flee. And so we're left with the worst. We're left with the Senate becoming increasingly, you know, like the green room at a B-list talk radio show in the eighties. <laughs> I mean, that's all one guy. That's mm. all Mitch McConnell. Mm. And if you take him out and you put somebody in there, who's a Patriot and you put somebody in there, who's an institutionalist who actually has an interest in doing anything about governing the whole country's trajectory is very, very different for this decade and beyond. Mm. He's been an incredibly effective person and everything he's done is to the detriment of the institutions this country needs to fix the problems that we have. Mm. And he has disabled us mm. um, and hurt the country in myriad ways that will be really, really, really hard to undo after he's gone. And that legacy and the fact that he's only ever been rewarded for it and never, ever paid any sort of price makes me angry. That's a good one. Also, <laughs> I don't like people who ride those motorized skateboards on the bike path. <laughs> when I you came here, you said one was going 45 miles an hour. <laughs> this guy, no, no helmet, on the phone, on his motorized skateboard, like weaving in and out of the people who are trying to get to freaking work. You guys, you're like a freaking human torpedo. Disarm. <laughs> See, everybody's angry about something. This unites us. So I'm I, now I, Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell. On an electric Mitch scooter. McConnell might be divisive. <laughs> electric scooters were small. You know, small, small number of people had a problem with my monologue. Not too many, but the skateboards is is you know another mutation of a mutation that is the 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 scooters. So I'm, skateboards are a whole yeah. other level. Maybe I'm we fine can with it as long as they don't interact with people yeah. who are not on electrified devices. Right. right. Okay. I want to go back to one and a really important question. You talked about Mitch McConnell. You talked about the lack of patriotism. Would you ever run for office? For elected office? Yes. No. Would you ever serve in an administration if called upon? If a president that you respected or admired said, Rachel Maddow, I think you can serve our country well in government, would you ever go inside? I would not say a categorical no to that because I've never really thought about it. I can't imagine that ever happening, but I wouldn't say categorically no. I would never run for office. I would never vote for me. So I can't. a lot of people would, and you could run in, in, if you know Kamala Harris maybe maybe uh, out of the Senate in California, uh, Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts. There, there. You know, no. you could run in California. You could run in Massachusetts. No. You're making that face. No, but but if Never. you ran tomorrow, no. you would be probably polling at least in the top three. If. I ran Joe Scarborough today. apparently is thinking about running. It's not like there aren't other people at MSNBC. And I don't say that to dismiss you at all because I say <laughs> it seriously because people increasingly have made the jump from media to politics. If I ran today. Yes, because you are If a I ran too. today for president of the Rachel Maddow show <laughs> where the Rachel Maddow show, everybody who works on or near the Rachel Maddow yeah. show gets to vote. I would not win to be president of the Rachel Maddow show. But the Rachel Maddow show is I not, not, is not a primary anything. state. So that's <laughs> Would you ever run? You would uh, run. I don't You'd think so. You'd be good so. at it. I don't think so. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't like the job. Like, I know the job. You know the job, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to raise money. I want to be able to think and make an impact. And I don't want to put my family through that, you know? Yeah. I mean, we've, I, I've had this discussion with other guests. It, it's, a, it's a shitty job. 
Um, would I say never? I don't know. Maybe when I'm an old guy, would I, would, you'd with, be so with good serving at the in poli- the Senate. The policy making part of it, you'd be so good at though. The good part is I know how it works now, yeah. and I know how to get things done. Which kind of the thing that kind of pulls me toward it on any level is seeing how many people are bad at it. Mm. Right? It actually, the mechanics of getting things done because a lot of it is not about strategy or policy; it's about execution. Right. And and um, there's the old saying in the in the military that amateurs focus on strategy and professionals focus on execution Mm. or logistics. Right. And I think there's a part of that that's missing right now. And when I see like Lawrence breaks it down sometimes, the tactical and technical capacity of making government work and making policy happen is very important. So I have experience there, but I I, I made a choice. And I think the media is the place for me at this point in time Mm -hmm. and for maybe my generation, for our generation. Yeah. Like that's where I think I can make an impact. And maybe more of an impact. And you know what you should be mad about? What? Freaking Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Because if the money and politics thing had been sorted so that it yeah. was not the full time job of everybody yeah. running for office yeah. to collect money from rich people and corporations, yeah. then you might think that job was not a crappy job and yeah. you might run and the country would be better for it. Well, I, th- I think that's the bigger issue is like, we, I wish there was a place where people could leave the farm for a couple of years, normal people could serve in government, yeah. and, and then go back to the farm or, or teaching or whatever it is that you do. I think that that is one of the most important you know, crises of leadership happening in this country right mm-hmm. now is that good people, patriotic people don't want to serve in government. Um, and I would love to be a part of, of creating more avenues, especially as someone who is an independent. I'm not a Democrat. Right. But you and I have talked about this at length. I don't think there are enough vehicles for people who are independents. Right. So I'd rather find ways to support people who are. And hopefully this show and other things I do can can do that. Um, but yeah, we're giving a fist pound. Mm-hmm. Um, I okay. have a, a, a last question for you. Okay is what's something that makes you happy? And also keeping in mind, a lot of folks listening to the show maybe having a, a rough day, a rough week, a rough year, and they look to the show and my guests for inspiration, you know, life inspiration. Never you, you come to a me long for way in your life. <laughs> and and uh, you told me not to give you any pep talks <laughs> in this interview. And this is not a pep talk. This is just, uh, a, a, you know, an appeal. Like what's, what are some things that make you happy? I'm, um, I'm blessed. I mean, I have a I have a great life. I'm super lucky in um, all the most important ways. Um, I mean, the the true answer is that compartmentalization makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> like I like that I can I have learned in my 40s to put my you know to to make my life a little bit of a bento box. Mm. Like oh look, it's not stew. Yeah. Like there's a main course, there's side courses, and there's little compartments between them. It's a TV dinner. Yeah. Um, and life is a TV dinner, (laughs) figuring out that the brownie should be separate from the Salisbury steak should be separate from the succotash was a important development in terms Mm. of my happiness. Like I have Mm. a great, great partner. We have a great family life. We have great extended family. I leave New York the second that I'm not working Mm. and I live in rural Western Massachusetts and my life there has nothing to do with my media life here. And I'm, you know, uh, I'm blessed and happy for that and figuring out that it was a good idea not to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, and to have things in my life that use my brain differently to, you know, be outside, to go fishing, to drive, to listen to music. Like that's, I'm, I'm happy for having figured that out and that's the way the rest of my life goes. Mm. Fishing is very important to you. Fishing is very important to me. Fishing more than catching. Fishing more than catching. I am not a fishy person, it mm. turns out. Dogs are very important to you. Dogs are important. Dogs make you happy. Do you know what I mean when I say I'm not fishy? I, I do. No, you don't. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. You're like, I'm thinking about this. And no. <laughs> no. I can generally keep up with you a lot, but sometimes I can't. So, do you ever go fishing? I, I No. You, as a kid, did I you? I did a lot with my dad, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I, li- I like fishing more now that I'm older. Yeah. I was definitely too impatient for fishing for many points in my life. But there was a time when I was like in my early teens where I would try to find a lake and, and fish. Uh, and now that I have, you know, kids, I really, I think I have a new reflection on that process. Walking distance from your apartment yes. this week, people are catching 36 inch long striped bass. I believe the, 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 the bass are that The big. bass are, the spring run of bass oh, is right now. And the stripers and are it's running, right? right by your apartment. Wow. Okay. So that, that can be uh, exclusive footage for afterward is me. There you go terribly trying to catch fish get yourself a fishing rod go down there with a fresh bunker and a ziploc bag and meet a dude to tell you how to put the hook on and do the whole thing and you will you will meet dudes down there and yes. you will be surprised the fish that come out of there are the size of freaking fifth graders the 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 the, the return of the hudson river is pretty amazing mm-hmm. i grew up on the hudson river near the hudson river yeah. 
and you know, up at the business end of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's 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 been fun to see that come around. Um, and I have I have to end with gifts for you, oh. as I do with each show. I have gifts. Um, and now this is a hard thing to do with you. So I'll start with the easy ones, which is I was gonna give you some new Angry Americans gear by <laughs> Oscar Mike. It's a matching T-shirt, so I can I, get this one dirty. I got different sizes. Um, one for you, one for Susan or whoever. That uh, we got two designs awesome. there for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, now wait, this is a this isn't a little SS lightning bolt, is it? No, little, no, know, it's not. It's, the, the angle no, on I never one thought of the about that. No, it's not. Definitely not. You that's have to not be what careful it is. there, big that's guy. Big bolt. Where's your guy? microphone? Right yeah, here. There you go. Okay. Yes, I know. Yes. No. No. A little careful with that. Yes. Good yeah. one. Thank you. Sure. Here to help uh, you. And then with we've your got the angry one. But then we've also Nazi imagery. We've, yeah, we've we also been um, sharing with guests this season peeps. <laughs> and so we Very have nice. a bag of peeps, bag of peeps, and we have three <laughs> colors. So the question is, first of all, I hope you enjoy them because I'm keeping peeps single-handedly in business after the season. But which color would you choose, Rachel? Blue, pink, or yellow? I'm old school. You got to use the mic. I'm um, old school. Yellow, yeah. yellow peeps. Why yellow? Just because this is the color that peeps are supposed to be. That's the same one that, that that Sarah Jessica Parker chose. Really? She did. Yes, she was a class. She called it the OG of peeps. That's <laughs> that's exactly right. Can I tell you the reason? Like the way that I know it's Easter. The way that I know that spring is here is that yeah. Susan and I will go to the grocery store together, and then she will peel off, and I won't. She won't say anything. She'll just be gone. I'll be like looking for, and I look for in all the normal aisles, like pasta aisle, yeah. grocery, like <laughs> produce aisle, like where dairy aisle, where is Susan? And I'll find her in the part of the grocery store where they have the seasonal confections and she'll be smelling the peeps. There's, there's, the sugar cloud of peep smell coming. It's, it's like, it draws her in like a butterfly to freaking milkweed. Like you can't keep her away from it. Do you know how to make any drinks with peeps? No. There are drinks with peeps. There sure. are not. They're, they're Those not? are not drinks. Okay. That's another thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. It, what's the difference between a drink and a cocktail? A cocktail has bitters in it and straight spirits. So it's bitters. I'll get this wrong, but it's supposed to have bitter, sugar, sweet, and water, actually. Wow. There's got to either have an ice or a water component to it. Okay. That's what makes a cocktail. I might have gotten that wrong, but I think that's how yeah, it goes. Probably Whereas a drink right. can be with your peep in it or whatever. Okay. See, I knew you'd educate me on, you educate me on everything. That, that's the amazingness of Rachel Maddow. Okay. Now, I've also been choosing a, um, a, a, a liquor. Whoa. Now, listen, here's the deal. I'm handing Rachel a, a, a standard New York City bag with a, with a liquor bottle in it. Now, it's like, it's every, like a magnum. <laughs> every week I go to the liquor store and try to find an American whiskey that mm -hmm. speaks to the guest. Now, you have the highest standards and proficiency in alcohol of anyone I know. So I just had to get something that was Dude. the most outrageously American I could find. It's the size of like a, a you have large to use, weapon. You have to use the, the mic. It's the size of a large weapon. It is very, gigantic. This is, Eagle it's, Rare is really good bourbon. It is, but it also has a giant eagle on it. <laughs> And it's gigantic. <laughs> and it and comes it says, with a motorcycle. And it, yeah, and, and, it's, and it's called Eagle. Wow. It's the most America, most America thing this I could America. find. This is 1.75 liters yes. of Eagle Rare bourbon. Almost you, as friend. big as the bottle of champagne you sent me when I stepped down as, as the head of IVA. I'm the only it was person bigger who's, than my son. I am the only person who sent you champagne for quitting your job, aren't I? Absolutely. Yeah. And it was amazing. Because I was like, you have been aiming your life at figuring out your transition for a long time and you finally freaking pulled it off. That, that was graduation day, man. Well, thank you. It was a relief. <laughs> it was like yeah. getting out of the army. Yeah. But you were there for us. One, one thing I, I have told people that you may not even remember your generosity knows no bounds. In 2008, when we passed the GI Bill, yeah. which has now sent over um, 1.5 million people to college, wow. you very, wow. and, and we had a very hardworking nonprofit staff, you very generously rented out an entire place, uh, a cheesesteak place, mm -hmm. and an open bar for the entire staff and everybody who did it. Yeah. <laughs> and that was wonderful. Because There's, we had been I busting mean, our ass. How many times do people that you know pass a new GI Bill. Like, you guys did something for the country that everybody, like, kind of appreciated, but, yeah. like, nobody was going to thank you for. I was like, I need to buy the meat. And we were very hungry, and it was amazing. It was like, see, you even... Like that, that's that's such a higher level thing that Trump would do. Like, Trump would do the stupid fast food thing for the Baylor women's basketball team, yeah. which is so tone deaf. 
You nailed it, though, because it was also top shelf liquor, and yeah. my team took well, good advantage of it. <laughs> but you were incredibly generous, and you continue to be incredibly generous. So I hope you enjoy the Super America whiskey. I love you, man. Thank whiskey. you. That is the most American thing I've ever seen in my life. And I just want to thank you for joining me on Angry Americans, for being a very dear friend and a supporter of so many people in this country that you never take credit for. Um, and I really created this show in part so I could have conversations with people that I admire and my friends mm -hmm. and you, you know, have been a person. I always wanted to have a show in part just so I could talk to you um, <laughs> because I feel so privileged to have had these conversations with you over the years yeah, and to have seen your impact on this country. And um, you're very humble. You don't get, uh, I think, appropriate uh, credit for how personally committed you are to this country and to the people in it. And I'm just incredibly grateful for all that you do for this country and for me and for my kids and for my grandkids. Your forthcoming grandkids. Yeah. I mean, I might retire soon and have some grandkids. <laughs> I don't know. Ryder but, is precocious, but come on. He is. He is, he is. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I, I want to thank you, you for always Thanks. being there for so many of us and uh, for taking us through these troubled waters over the last few years and taking us ahead. And when this is... Whenever this is done, you deserve a very, very big vacation with lots of fishing and bourbon and peeps. You will know that that's about to happen when we do when we bring back the cocktail moment. That will yes. be my signal. Oh, I won't say that's what's going on. I will just subtly bring back the cocktail moment, and you will know that I believe we have turned the corner. We America looks forward to that day. Thank I you, Rachel you, Maddow. Thanks. We love you very much. Thanks, Paul.